Aleluya. your name Lord we honor you King Jesus we magnify you you're great you're sovereign you're holy bless your name oh God good evening Webster God bless you thank you Jesus Bless your name, Jesus. Bless your name. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. We glorify you, Lord. You are great. You are merciful. You're sovereign, Lord. You're holy. You are just. You are the good shepherd that watches over us, your people. And we thank you, Lord God, for your peace that surpasses all understanding. We're honored, Lord, to come into your presence again, oh God, giving you thanks and praise for who you are. You are the rock upon which we stand. You're our conquering king. You're our redeemer. You are our savior. And we bless your name, O oh God. Well, praise the Lord. I thank the Lord for another opportunity to study the word of God together again. Thank the Lord for what he's doing in and through all of our lives, how he continually keeps on doing great things for us. Every day of our lives, he wakes us up, clothes in the right minds. We're not crazy. We haven't lost our mind, but we, we need to lose our mind. We need to lose our mind and get his mind. Because sometimes our mind messes us up. But the mind of Christ will orchestrate and guide you in the path that God has ordained for you to walk in. So this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. So I thank the Lord again for this lesson that he has given me to teach. And I pray that it's being inspirational to all of God's people who are hearing the word of God and allowing the word of God to minister to their hearts. You know, one thing about the spirit of bondage we started on last week discussing about the spirit of bondage. You know, God is our father. You know, and anytime we need our father, we can call him and he will answer us. He will show up in the nick of time, on time, out of time, right on time to be in time just to help you in your time of need. You know, when we trust God in his word, God promises that anytime we utter a word from our mouth before even a word come out of our mouth, he already done heard us. That, that's amazing. That God knows your every thought before you even utter a word from your mouth. He knows about you. And, and it's amazing and it's good to know that no matter what situation arises in my life, he's there. He's there answering us according to his will to deliver us and set us free. But we have to be willing to be to allow the Holy Spirit to do his work in our life to set us free. If we don't want to be free, we can continue to be bound in the, in the place of captivity, a spiritual place of bondage. So let's go into a word of prayer. Gracious God, our Father, we thank you for another chance, oh God, to get things right with you. We thank you, Lord God, for your grace being sufficient. 
We thank you for the word of God that you've spoken into our hearts, oh God, to inspire us, to edify us, to give us understanding, give us clarity, to open our eyes to see, Father God, what you see, our ears to hear your voice, and that we open our mouths and speak from the utterance of the Holy Spirit, the word of God, over our own lives, over our family, over our children, over our community, over our nation, over our cities. We can speak the word of God and expect God to produce a change in the atmosphere around us, that our lives will be more fru fruitful and, and abundant and futile to keep producing a harvest, Father God, of souls that you're calling to your kingdom for such a time as this. You gave us a command to go into the world to teach and to preach the gospel and to all men that souls will be saved. And we ask, Lord God, tonight, as we go into your word, first of all, God, forgive us for our sins. Forgive us for our idle thoughts. Forgive us for our actions. Come into our hearts and purge us with the blood of the Lamb. Sanctify us. Fill us up with the freshness of the Holy Spirit that we walk in obedience and submit it to the call upon our lives to bring you glory in everything we do in the life that we live. And we thank you, Lord God. Now touch our hearts, O God, to receive the word tonight, O God, with wisdom, knowledge, and understanding that we'll be able to apply it to our own hearts, O God, to allow the transformation to pl take place in our minds, our bodies, our souls, and our spirit. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you tonight, everyone. Good, good evening, uh, sister. Good to see you, Monique. Truly, God is amazing. I don't know about you, but God is good. He's good, and his mercy never ends. It never ceases. He keeps on being merciful towards us when we deserve judgment. I don't know about you, but sometimes I make mistakes in my own life, and, and yet God, being a merciful God, he said, you know what? I paid for that too. I knew you were going to fall short of my, of my glory, so I already paid for it. I knew you're going to make a mistake. I already paid for it. I knew you're going to have a messed up mind. I already paid for it. Everything that we do in this life, God says the things that cause us to fall into an entrapment of a spiritual bondage, he paid for that too. That error in your life that no one else knows about, guess what? He paid for that too. So only thing God looks for us as, as a believer or a child of God is our confession. Will we acknowledge I fall short of your glory? We acknowledge that we have mistakes. We acknowledge we mess up. Acknowledge that we, we get entwined in the things of the world that's not of God. And allow the Holy Spirit to come into your heart to empower you to live a fruitful and abundant and a free life in Christ Jesus. And I guarantee that God will set you free. If you go with me to Galatians chapter 5, our key verses for this, this uh, segment of our book, The Strong Man, His Name, What's His Game, is Galatians chapter 5. Beginning at, I'm going to start at, it starts at verse 18 in the book, but I'm going to start at verse, uh, verse 16. And it reads as following. It said, this I say then. Now, this is Apostle Paul. We got to get an understanding. He's talking to the church at, at, at Galatia. And he taught, he's reminding them of the liberty that Christ paid for them and how they were entangled in the spiritual conflict of warring with each other and allowing there to be confusion in the house of God because of the law. And one thing about God, he knows that we are not in a position in our own mindsets to fulfill the law, the reason he sent Jesus to pay the price for us. Because you start at verse 1, he says, Stand in the liberty what with Christ has made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. So that yoke of bondage is that slavery to the law mentality. And so Christ has paid the price that we would not have to be victimized by the law, held, held in, under the punishment and requirements of the law. So he paid the price for it because he knew that as an uncircumcised Philistine mentality or demonic people, that we cannot live a fruitful life in him without him. 
So the only way we can live a fruitful life, verse 2 says, Behold, I, Paul, say unto you that if ye be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. He's talking about the cutting away of the flesh. See, and this is dealing with a spiritual aspect, not just a physical. During the Old Testament law, they were required to even be uh, uh, walking in the, in the promise of God. They had to circumcise themselves, the male child, and begin to take away the cutting of the flesh, which is a symbolization of taking away some of the things that are not of God in your life. So as they cut the flesh, God wants us to do the same thing in today's time, is to cut away the things of the world. So what Paul is saying that if you are circumcised, he said, then Christ should profit you nothing. He's talking about because based on the mentality of the law, not based on what Christ has done for you. Then he says, for I testify again unto you, every man that is circumcised, that he is a debtor to the whole law. So if you allow yourself to try to keep the requirements of the law, he's telling us that you can't do it. In other words, if you mess up on one part of a law, that God has given the Mosaic law to the children of Israel, you mess up on one part, you are guilty of the whole law. Then he says, verse 4, If Christ be of no effect unto you, whosoever of you are justified by the law, ye have fallen from grace. So in other words, if you try to keep the law and live by the law, he said you fell. But we know that when we come to the place of receiving Christ in our lives today, that we are no longer held under the requirements of the law. We're held under the responsibility of surrendering and yielding and releasing ourselves into the life of Christ and allow him to live his life through us. He paid the price for you. So because he paid the price, verse 5 says, for we, for, for we through the spirit wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. Christ paid the price for righteousness. So by faith, we, we wait, expecting, hoping for this righteousness that comes through accepting him in our lives. Without Christ, there is no righteousness. But with Christ, there's right living, right relationship, and right standing with God. And then verse 6, it says, For in, for in Jesus Christ, Neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but by but faith worketh by love. It says, but faith worketh by love. So in Christ, there's no circumcision that can avail to anything. In other words, the circumcision cannot make you right with God. And that's what Paul is talking to the church of Galatia, letting them know that, hey, no matter what you do, this law can't make you right with God. The only way to get right with God is through Christ Jesus by the Holy Spirit. Then he goes on verse 7. I'm just giving you a, re a little synopsis of what the chapter is talking about. Then I'm going to skip back down to verse 16. He said, you did run well. Who hindered you that you should not obey the truth? Isn't that something? Paul says, you ran well when you first received Christ as your Savior but somewhere down the road, you would trip back up into falling after the law requirements and the sinful nature. So because of this mentality, you were held in captivity back into a place of bondage. And he says, you ran well. You know, when you started out with a zeal for Christ, a zeal to share the gospel, the zeal to win souls for the Lord. But somewhere down the road, you slipped off the bandwagon. You fell back into that, that muck and that mire, that sinful lifestyle, that sinful mentality, the sinful things that gratify and appeases the flesh. He said you fell back into it, and because of this, now you held in captivity. Then he goes on and said, but this persuasion comes not of him that calleth you. So if Christ called you, then this type of behavior shall not have an influence in your life. Then he says, verse 9, a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. You know how leaven is? It's like taking yeast and you're making some bread. If you don't put that, that rising of, of, of powder in there to make the, 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 the bread rise, it says it's going gonna, it's gonna to leaven the whole lump. It's going to be hard. It's going to be flat. And that's what happens in your spirit. If you don't allow the Holy Spirit to come into your heart to purge you from the leaven, the debris, the agents that cause you to, to not rise up in Christ, he said you're going to be held into captivity of the whole lump of sin. So a little sin, people say, well, I told a, a, a partial lie, but I, I was telling the truth, but I gave part of a lie. 
A little lie ain't nothing but a whole lie. You can't have lie and truth met together. If you're going to tell the truth, or you're going to tell a lie. So we got to get to the place within our spirits. We get in the word of God and allow the word of God to get into our hearts. And the word of God will change your thinking. It will change your mentality. It will change your behavior. It will change your lifestyle. Because in order to be free, we got to allow the Holy Spirit to come into our hearts to filtrate all that junk out of us through the filter of the Holy Spirit. And as he takes the sister, he gets all that mess that's not productive in your life, and he purges it out of you, and he replaces those things with the characteristics, the nature, the attitude of Christ. Then verse 11 says, And I, brethren, if I yet preach circumcision, why do you yet suffer persecution? Then if the offense of the cross ceased, then the offense of the cross has ceased. So he said, if I'm preaching circumcision based on the law, he said, why are you suffering persecution? So if you're supposed to be living right, then this shouldn't be happening to you. But then he says, but the offense of the cross, it ceases. In other words, the cross didn't mean no good to you. It had no, no influence, no power. It, it, it didn't take place in your life the way it should have been effective. He said, I would that they were cut off which trouble you. But Jesus lets us know, as a child of God, in this life, you're going to suffer persecution. But he says you got to have the attitude of him not to go through the persecution. The problem comes in when we're going through persecution, we let the persecution define our attitude. So when it finds our attitude, then we find ourselves miserable and we're venting and ranting and gnashing our teeth at other people because I'm miserable. <coughs> Excuse me. So we got to get to the place. So Paul says, I would that they were cut off, that trouble you. So your, 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 your haters are your elevators. But Paul says, if it was up to me, I, I would that they would be cut off from you and don't even bother you no more. But without the persecution, it will never force you to be who you are today. Or define your character. Persecution defines who you are in Christ. Persecution defines the type of lifestyle you're going to live. Persecution it defines your mentality. Because if you're affected by the persecutions, the things that people say, the things people do, and how they respond to you, then you haven't really yielded to the cross. Because Jesus told us, if any man decide to come out to me, you must first deny yourself, which killing yourself, killing that flesh and his desires and his passions, daily take up your cross and follow me. Then you go to verse 13. He says, for brethren, ye have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh. But by love, serve one another. By love, serve one another. So it's very important as a child of God, a believer, is to believe that, hey, I've been called unto liberty. That means freedom. No captivity. Only use your liberty to please God and not to please your flesh. And he says, but love one another by serving one another. We find that difficult as people who claim to be born again to serve one another because if they don't treat me the way I expect them to treat me, I don't want to help them. Even though I know I got what they need, so I allow my flesh to dictate to me how I'm going to respond to them. So I respond according to how I feel, not what the Holy Spirit is telling me to do. So we got to get to the place we recognize, God bless you, we got to recognize the importance of serving one another in love. If you don't want to help a person, don't do it if you ain't going to do it in the right attitude. That's what Paul is talking about. Your attitude needs to be the altitude to reach heaven. So heaven responds to you with the attitude of Christ. And the attitude of Christ will respond to the individual who you're trying to help with love. 
So anything that come out of you is still going to be an outpouring of love and not resentment or bitterness or hatefulness or spitefulness because I don't like how they talk to me. Then he goes on verse 14. He says, for all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. So you got to love your neighbor as yourself. That's so important. It is so important. Then he goes on and said, but if ye bite and devour another, one another, take heed that ye be not consumed of one another. You hear what he just said here? We bite and devour one another. Why? In other words, we're fighting each other. We're bickering with one another. So you talk bad to me, I'm retaliating with negative words to you. So we're being devoured of one another. But he said, don't be consumed with one another. In other words, you may have a disagreement. We got to get to the place where we recognize we can agree to disagree. So if I agree to disagree, I can still love my brother and my sister with the love of the Lord. Regardless of what shortcomings and things they have done to me, the forgiveness of Christ would extend to them anyway the love of God. Because I have to forgive in order to love. That's a key point right there. You have to forgive in order to love. How can you love your love God and hate your brother who you see daily? It doesn't work that way. You can't love your brother and, and call yourself loving God and you hate your brother. <coughs> Excuse me. You got to love God and love your brother with the love of God or your sister with the love of God. Which brings me to this point, verse 16. This I say then, after all this he just talked about, the liberty and the law and the circumcision. He said, now I got something that I want to capture your attention with. Walk in the spirit and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. That's a key point. It's a scripture you need to add to your library. Something you need to apply to your life every day. That I will walk in the spirit. If you got to look at yourself in the mirror and say, self, today I'm going to walk in the spirit. That I will not fulfill the lust of my flesh. You have the power to control yourself. Sometimes we don't think we do. Because that mindset makes us doubt God's word and make us doubt who we are in Christ and make us doubt our, our responsibility to God. And the enemy tells you, you can't overcome this. You can walk in your flesh. You ain't going to walk in the spirit every day. God knows your heart. Yes, he does. Jeremiah 17 and 9. He knows the heart of man is definitely wicked. God knows it. He knows our hearts are wicked. He knows our hearts will fall short of his glory. But yet, he said, don't make an excuse when you use your liberty to sin. So then he says, verse 17, for if the flesh lusted against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh, these are contrary one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. Isn't that amazing? How powerful your flesh is? Your flesh is a dirty book. That flesh will dominate and control and rip you to shreds. Because once it pulls out your authority, delinquish your power, the enemy takes control of your thought life. And he infiltrates your mind with the junk and the debris from the world that will hold you in bondage. And he said the flesh lusts. In other words, it warreth. It fights against. It rebels against the Holy Spirit. And the spirit rebels against the flesh. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is of God. And he's not going to allow you to manipulate and control him to walk in sin. So the Holy Spirit inside of you tells us that, hey, you can overcome this thing. You have the power within you. Christ paid the price for you. you you're a person of power and authority. Walk in the liberty. It says, these are contrary one to the other. That you cannot do the things that you would. Then he says, but if ye be led of the spirit. You're not under the law. If you're led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. But then he goes on in verse 19, the key verse for this, this uh, passage that we're discussing tonight about the spirit of bondage. So now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. I'm going to read this in the uh, NIV. 
Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God in the highest. In the NIV, it puts it this way. Now the acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, this excessive drinking, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambitions, dissensions. That's, that's like bringing up confusion, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. Those who live a life of all these things listed here in this category will not inherit the kingdom of God. And the Lord knows those of, those of you who are his, but he also knows those of you who are not his. God bless you, brother. And he tells us that if you walk in contrary to the Lord's power, his authority, to his will, his desires for your life, you're walking these other categories. But then he says, but the fruit, verse 22, the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, goodness, kindness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. If you don't have self-control, then you allow the enemy to control you and not the thought life of the Holy Spirit. And that's one of the major components of the fruit of the Spirit that a believer must have in their life is self-control. If you don't have self-control, you're out of control. And if you're out of control, who's controlling you? Think about it. So last week, we started a discussion on the spirit of bondage. The strong man, he knows. He knows when we are in a place of vulnerability. He knows when we're in a place of submission to the flesh. He knows when we're not prayed up. He knows when we're not consecrated. He knows when our minds are just tossed, just torn apart. And he do everything in his power to keep you from coming to the place of surrendering to God's Lord, to the Lordship of the Lord. So, last week we discussed the spirit of bondage. Some of the characteristics of the spirit of bondage were what things I just listed here, but fear of death, addictions, fears, service of corruptions, captivity to Satan, compulsive sin, and bondage to sin. So tonight we're going to talk about the addictions, the addictions. And I looked up some scriptures. We talked about get your authority on last week, and it's so important to get your authority and walk in your liberty. So tonight we're going to talk about, according to the book, the addictions. Some of the manifestations of the spirit of bondage are addictions to any kind, such as drugs, alcohol, cigarettes, food, television, video games, pornography, and unnatural sex acts. The other extremes of addiction to food is anorexia or nervousness, self-induced starvation, which is nervosa, self-induced starvation. Rock music has an addictive quality that is distinctive. In addition to the unwholesome message, it usually spotlights. In a short, as the name implies, Anything that binds us so that we become involuntary slaves fall under the category of the spirit of bondage. So anything that captivates your attention to where it brainwashes you, it controls you, it brings you to a place of spiritual captivity, bondage. Like he mentioned here, rock music. Rock music is, has a lot of satanic messages. When you listen to rock, I used to listen to rock music back in the early days in my teen, teenage years, even in the military. And I used to listen to those things and then realize that the, the power of the enemy that was behind those messages were controlling my attitude, was controlling my life. Until God gave me a revelation that when you play certain records back during that time, that like Prince had Purple Rain when it came out, if you played that record backwards, it had a demonic message. 
And God began to reveal these things years later that the more you feed on those things, the more they will control you. And that's the enemy trick in his trap to lure you in and hold you in a place of bondage. So then, alcoholism. Another characteristic is alcoholism. Alcoholism is, a, is probably the most pre, pre, prominent and popular addiction in the world today. It is classified as a disease by some medical authorities, but God's word does not support that diagnosis. Paul informs us in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 10, that drunkards will not inherit the kingdom of God. The only reason God permits anyone to go to hell is because of their sin. So apparently God considers drunkenness to be a sin, not a disease. So if you're a person who's bound up and you got to drink every day, you got to indulge in alcoholism, Paul puts it this way, you're in bondage. You're a prison to alcoholism. You're a prison to Satan who's behind the alcoholism. There's a spirit behind the spirit. And when you recognize the spirit behind the spirit, you can cast that spirit out in the name of Jesus. So, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, it says, No temptation, and this is in the English Standard Version, No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. But God is faithful. He will not allow you to be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation... He will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. In other words, God will not put more on you than you can bear. God knows what you can handle and he knows what you can't handle. So God says, I'm giving you the remedy, as Paul was writing to the church of Corinthians, he said, I give you the remedy to overcome the temptation is trusting and depending on me because God is faithful. If God is faithful, would God ever be unfaithful to you when you find yourself caught up in temptation? No. The devil is a lie. God would never abandon you in temptation. We abandon God because we turn off our, our, our senses to the, to the Holy Spirit when we're not hearing his voice. We're not he, smelling the fragrance of the Holy Spirit. We're not hearing his voice. We're not speaking the word of God. We're not devouring the word of God. We're not doing anything God wants to do. We're not handling the word of God. We're not getting, getting hold of the word of God. So the enemy takes control of you and holds you in bondage to temptation. 1 Peter verse, chapter 5, verse 8. It says, be sober-minded. Be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, Seeking someone to devour. The devil's looking for you. He's looking for me. And you know what? When you are hidden in Christ, when Christ rose from the dead, check, check this out. The Bible tells us when Christ rose from the dead, we were hidden in Christ in the heavenly place. So when the enemy comes at you, when you are submitted and you're yielded, to the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ, he don't see you anymore. He sees Christ revealed through you. So he can't touch you. The reason why no temptation is able to overtake you that is common or the most reasonable thing that we can do in this world to mankind, God says, because we're hidden in Christ. <clears throat> if you're hidden in Christ and you recognize Whatever it is that comes to test, try, and prove you, I can stand victorious in Christ Jesus because he paid the price. So we got to get to the place we recognize, I can't do it on my own. I need Christ in my life. My strength is weak. Sometimes I get tossed and turned by the society, by people judging me, prejudging me, all these things, racialism, bitterness, malice, jealousy, hatred. All these things are the characteristics of the human nature. But when you're walking in the spirit, it no longer has its power in your life until you give it the power. The statistics related to alcoholism are incredible. Alcohol is the number 
two public health problem in America today. And it's getting more and more serious. 10 million Americans are alcoholics and 20 million more are high risk drunkards. You hear that? This was written back in the 90s. So you can imagine the number has to increase. 10 million Americans are alcoholics. 20 million are more of a high risk drunkards. That's why you have so many reckless driving, people drinking, driving, you know, because they're under the influence of something. It might be drug addiction. It doesn't matter what it is. If you're under the influence of things that control your mindset and your, your behavior and your responses, you're bound. You're in bondage. Seven of 10 Americans use alcohol as a beverage. I've known people that tell you when they're leaving work, as soon as I go home, I'm getting me a beer because I, I need my beer to wind down for the day. I done had a hectic time at work, so I got to have my beer. You know, that's, that's, that's alcoholic. And they they deny it. They swear they're not an alcoholic. They argue with you, say they're not an alcoholic. But deep within, God calls you an alcoholic. Because you have no power over it and it controls your every every idea and your concept and your thought life, it, you, you're alcoholic. One third of those who call themselves evangel evangelistical drink alcohol as do half of all ministers. It is estimate that alcohol causes or contributes directly to 205 thousand death each year in the United States and that number has increased since then. Alcohol is a major cause of divorce, wife abuse, and child molestation. The cost to industry is estimated, this is like I said, this is back in the 90s, 63 billion annually. 63 billion annually is the estimated cost for alcohol in the US. In the last 10 years, 250,000 people have been killed in alcohol-related car accidents. Alcohol is responsible for one half of all homicides and one third of all suicides. The lifespan of an alcoholic is shortened by 10 to 12 years. If alcoholism is a disease, it is only the one on earth that is spread by advertising. In spite of the terrible carnage, destruction, the grief, and the loss, alcohol, alcoholic drinks are extolled on billboards, in magazines, and newspapers, and on radios and television as a product that everyone should imbibe. In other words, everybody needs alcohol. If alcoholism is a, alcoholism is a disease, why don't the authorities step out the virus that caused it? Isn't that something? They don't stop this because it's making billions of dollars and bringing it to the country. You know, and the thing is, God calls it a disease. God, God didn't call it a disease, he calls it a sin. It's a bondage because it's a controlled substance. Anything that's controlled substance, it controls your, your every move. It, it controls your attitude. It controls your mentality. It, it controls the way you look. I've known people who drank so much, their skin got dark. It would dry it up. They looked dry because they drank so much, it, it started killing the life that's in them. And that's what alcohol would do. Alcohol would dry you up. You ever take rubbing alcohol and you rub it on, on, a, on a wound or a bruise on your arm or your leg? What it does, it dry it up. Till it draw, draws out the soreness. It'll draw out the pain. It'll draw out the discomfort but also it'll dry your skin. The enemy does the same thing with a believer. When we continue to indulge in the things of the world that's not of God, it's like taking alcohol and consuming it on an everyday basis to begin to dry up the life inside of you to where you begin to wither and die. When polio was an epidemic, the medical world swung into action and discovered a vaccine to halt the dreaded disease. But right now, even more uh, virulent pandemic epidemics is raging and virtually nothing can be done. Every year, 120,000 men, women, and children are crippled in wrecks caused by drunk drivers. For the most part of our courts, for the most part, 
Our courts let most drunk drivers off with a slap on the wrist. Some drunks have been convicted repeatedly before they kill someone. Even drunk drunk driving who kills people go, you know, it's a, often go without any meaningful punishment. And that's true. We see it today in the news. People who dro drove drunk and then killed someone, what they do? They may go to jail for a short time, then they right back out on the street doing the same thing again. Why? Because they're addicted. They're addicted to alcoholism, and because they're addicted to the alcoholism, they, they're, they're bound in a place they can't set themselves free, even if they want to be free. I heard people say, you know, I wish I could stop this. I wish I can get myself right for the Lord. You will never get yourself right. Think about it. If you had the power, you had the authority to get yourself right, you don't need Jesus. It's plain and simple. You don't need Jesus. If you can do this yourself, you don't need the Holy Spirit to come into your life to change you. If you have the power to do it yourself. But the devil's a lie because we can't do it ourselves. Many times we deceive ourselves in thinking, I can stop drinking anytime. I heard people tell me this. Oh, I can stop drinking anytime I want to. I can stop doing this. I can stop doing that. If I choose to do it, I ain't going to do it. You're right. You can. But it's only for a short time. Because eventually you're going to find yourself back in the same category doing the same thing again. Just like the spider. When a fly flies into a spider's well, he thinking it was a place of comfort, but yet it turned out to be his own demise, a place of entrapment. The enemy does the same thing before us as born-again believers. He has set before you things that look appealing and delightful and pleasant to the eyes. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. That's what the enemy does. He wants to lure you in by the appetite of your flesh because I can get you captivated by the thing that satisfies your, 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 your eyes. I can get you to indulge in it and then I can control you with it. And that's what the enemy does. He gives you the controlled substance that he knows is going to call you to call, fall into a place where you turn from the Lord. The Bible tells us in James chapter 1 verse 8 says, it says, but verse six, actually verse six, it says, but when you ask, and I fact, go to verse five, James chapter one, verse five, it says, if any of you lack wisdom, you should ask God who gives generally to all, to all without fault finding and, and will be given to you. So if you need wisdom for any situation in your life, say, ask God. But then it goes on, it says, but when you ask, you must believe and not doubt because the one who doubts is like the wave of the sea blown, tossed, is it blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. But then it goes on. It says such a person is double minded and unstable in all they do. So your stability if you don't have the wisdom of God governing God and ruling in your heart, it will cause you to be in a place of stagnancy. It will hinder your spiritual growth. It will stop you from moving, stop you from doing and fulfilling the call upon your life. It will dry up your vision, your dreams, the promises, the purpose God has for you. It, the enemy knows just what he's doing to destroy you. And we so foolishly walk into the, like I said, the spider's web. We precariously, lackadaisically, just go into the entrapment of the enemy, into the spider web, and we get stuck. And we wrestle, we pull, we twist, we turn, we try to get out of it. The more I struggle, the more entanglement I get. So once you entangle with no more movement, then the spider comes, which is the devil himself. He comes and he pounces on you and begin to bite you. Until he sucks out the life out of you. So you got to get to the place where you get in the word of God on a daily basis. Allow the word to get inside of you. Can you see them swinging on the breeze on Satan's web? It says they think we're crazy because we don't like spiders. And it's talking about the drunkard who gets stuck in the entrapment of the enemy. It says, note the statistic is that one third of those who call themselves evangelistical drinks alcohol as do one half of all ministers. Just reading above st statistic 
should convince any Christian that alcohol must be shunned as it was a coil of a rattlesnake. In fact, it was Solomon's advice in Proverbs 23, verse 31 and 32. He said, look not, he said, look not thou upon the wine when it is red. He said, at the last, he said, at the last it biteth like a serpent and stingeth like an adder. So Solomon who was the wisest man in the Bible, God called him the wisest man in the Bible, he spoke of this years ago, thousands of years ago, that you are the shun alcoholism because it's like, like he said, he said, don't, he said, we look at the pond of wine, he said, don't lick the wine because it's red. He said, because when you start drinking and devouring the wine, it bites like a serpent, it stings like an adder. In other words, it's poison. It kills you. The poison, and many people who are bound by alcoholism, don't realize the damage they're doing to the internal organs. That's why he said it bites like a serpent, stinging like an adder. Because a serpent and an adder, when they bite you, they inject poison in you. And that poison will begin to spread throughout your bloodstream and go into every vital organ in your body until it, it begins to kill everything in you and you die. For the rest of those it says, for the rest of their case, Paul's admonition to Timothy that he used little wine for his stomach's sake. First Timothy chapter 5, verse 23, we would res respectfully draw their attention to Paul's command uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, 11, not to even keep company with or eat with Christians who drink to excess. And observe the list Paul lumped them together with in verse 11. Fornicators, adulterers, covetous, idols, and railers, and extortioners. Why? Because one sin leads to another sin. One sin leads to another sin. So the more you indulge in sin, the more you indulge in alcoholism, it begins to lead you to do other things that's foolish. That's out of the will of God to where it begins to entrap you and bait you and destroy you. So the enemy knows if I can bait you, give you a little taste of the alcohol to where you keep coming back for more, then I can stop you in your trap. I can take away your devotion from seeking God's face. I can take away your Bible reading time from getting into the Word of God. I can take away your influence by the Holy Spirit to do what's right. Everything that the enemy does is always a spirit behind the spirit to entrap you. And once he entraps you, then he can and he will destroy you, you know, used to God. But God has a remedy, and that remedy is Jesus. We're going to continue this on next week. The remedy is Jesus. When you get to the place and you recognize the sin in your life, the thing that's in your heart that's not of God, that's the Holy Spirit convicting you. The Holy Spirit loves us so much. He convicts the world of sin. Jesus said when he was getting ready to leave his disciples, he said, I'm not going to leave you comfortless, but he said, I'm going to go to the Father. And when I go to the Father, I'm going to pray that he sends you another comforter. What's a comforter? The advocate, the one who intercedes, the one who stands in the gap with you, the one who goes through the troubles and trials and tests with you. He said, and then he will convict the world of sin. Not only will he convict the world of sin, but he will bring back to your remembrance the thing wherewith I have taught you. The things that we learned about Christ, the life we live, and the word of God that's been spoken in our lives. We need to be reminded of the thing every day of our life. Stay in the word. Get in the word. And allow the word to ring in your ear. Even when you sleep, you can play the word. They have Bible CDs. They have Bible tools on the computers. You can play the word 24-7 if you choose because of the resource we have today in our time. But the problem comes in, we don't want to hear the word because I'm so used to doing things my way. And my way is not necessarily the best way because my way will mess up God's way in my life. So I pray that something has been said tonight that encourages you, that will strengthen you to get into God's word, to allow the word to get inside of you, to allow the word of God to speak to you and get into your heart, convict you and bring change in your mentality, 
to your life will begin to line up with God's word. And anyone got any questions before we close tonight? You got any questions or comments? Anyone like to uh, submit at this time? Anyone got a question? Hallelujah. Glory to God. So, as we always do each week, I'm going to ask everyone to pray with me this prayer. It was a simple prayer. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, I ask you to come into my heart. Forgive me for my sins, knowingly and unknowingly, to wash me clean in the blood of the Lamb. Come into my heart and be my Lord and Savior. And I thank you for saving me. I thank you for forgiving me. And I thank you for bringing me to right standing and right relationship with you through your son, Jesus. Now, Lord, fill with the Holy Spirit and that with power to be a witness for you. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer, are you one who don't know Jesus, your Lord and Savior? Welcome to the family of God. And if you're one who prayed that prayer and you knew that there's somewhere in your life, you, you got off the bandwagon, you were short, God just restored you. And the process will continue to work in you as God revives you, he refreshes you, he strengthens you, he continues to encourage you, and he draws you. God is drawing you tonight to get back to your place of consecration. Get back to your place where you seek God's face until you get a rhema word from God. That rhema word is a spoken, specific spoken word from God for you. And every time God speaks a word, his word brings a change in our lives for the better. So, Father, tonight we thank you for your word, Father, that's gone over the airways. I pray that your word will not return to your void. But we have heard your word tonight, God, that your word will continue to evict us, to challenge us, to strengthen us, and to change us to become more and more like you in Jesus' name. Now, Lord, may the Lord be gracious to you. May the Lord bless you. May his face shine upon you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, God bless you again for tuning in. Thank you very much, everyone who came on tonight. Share, share this word with someone else that you know might need to hear this word. And allow the word to minister to you as well as to them. And by faith, receive it. Allow that word to feed you as the shepherd fed me. He's going to continue to feed you as he feeds us all. As we have a hunger and a thirst for righteousness to be filled. God is going to fill you. Until next time, y'all have a great night. And may the Lord continue to meet your every need. If you have a need tonight, financially, spiritually, or emotionally, I release the promise of God over you that every need will be met by Christ Jesus. As you keep the faith, you keep standing on God's word. God says in his word, you have not because you ask not. Whatever it is you believe in God for tonight, Begin to ask God for what you want. Believe God that he would do it and by faith receive it. And expect God to bring it forth in your life. And I guarantee, I bank my life on it, it will happen. Because that's the God we serve. A God who's a covenant keeping God who would not turn his back on you in your time of need. But he promised to surround you, to cover you, protect you, shield you, and guide you. And may the Lord guide you into all truth as you continually seek his face. You all have a good night.